Today we'll be talking about chapter 18, section 2, and it's called the Spanish-American War. And we're going to be talking about how in 1898, the United States went to war to help Cuba win its independence from Spain. Now, Americans have had a long relationship with Cuba. Cuba is 90 miles off the coast of Miami. In fact, I'll be taking a cruise passing not too far from there this summer. Um, it's always been a close proximity to the United States, and so we've always had a relationship. Not always a very good relationship, but certainly we've always had a relationship with this area. Um, from 17... 89, when our country was officially ratified under the U.S. Constitution until 1898, Cuba was a colony of Spain. However, in the mid-1800s, Cuba was undergoing a revolution, very similar to the American Revolution. The only difference is theirs failed, and Spain remained the imperial power of Cuba. But then a second revolution began in the 1890s. And during this revolution, a famous poet and journalist and writer named Jose Marte was leading the fight for independence. He was charismatic. He was well-spoken. He had attracted quite a following. And he had inspired many Americans. And so really, U.S. public opinion was split. You see, on one side, American business interest supported Cuba's relationship with Spain because Spain represented stability in Cuba. much like in Iraq, while for many years Iraq was under the leadership of the United States, the United States provided a degree of stability for their country. And so American opinion tended to support U.S. involvement in Iraq until more recently. Same principle in Spain. U.S. business interests wanted stability, there were quite a few sugar plantations owned by Americans in Cuba, and so we had a vested interest in seeing Spain's continued rule over Cuba. However, this journalist, Jose Marte, again, charismatic, outspoken, a revolutionary, really attracted many Americans because, well, isn't that what we were all about? Isn't our country based on a revolution? Weren't we fighting for those same ideals of freedom and independence that now Jose Marte is leading in his country? And now to make matters worse, Spain called in their toughest general, General Valerino, oh, my Spanish is terrible, excuse me, Valeriano Wheeler, was sent to Cuba to restore order. Now, putting down a rebellion is a very difficult task. I don't know if you've seen Star Wars, but it's a very difficult task to put down a rebellion. I mean, you can blow up planets and they still rebel, seriously. So how do you actually put down a rebellion? Well, number one, what General Wheeler did was to put around 300,000 Cubans into concentration camps. 300,000 Cubans in the concentration camps, seriously. Basically, any suspected revolutionary sympathizers would be isolated from the rest of the population. And the purpose here was to quell the rebellion without having to kill all the Cubans by isolating those who were supposedly the, quote, enemy. But the trick in a revolution, in a rebellion, is who is the enemy? Right? In Star Wars New Hope, Vader boards the ship with Princess Leia, and Princess Leia says, I'm not the enemy. I'm a member of the Senate. 
And now Vader, even Vader, right? Like kills everybody with the lightsaber. Vader scratching his head. Well, is she? He says, no, you're part of the Rebel Alliance and you're a traitor. She says, no. Well, how do you know? Well, what did they do? Well, they threw her in jail. They can't just kill her. They don't know for sure, so they have to isolate her. So that's what it means by concentration camps. Well, the bottom line is, when you go around throwing, quote, innocent people in prison, it makes you look bad. And this is where newspapers had a field day. Two newspapers in particular, and you're learning about these in your group project. The New York Herald and um, the San Francisco Herald, if I remember correctly. New York Post and San Francisco Herald. And one ruled by, one ran by Joseph Pulitzer and the other by William Randolph Hearst. And these two newspaper publishers saw an opportunity. Because I don't know about you, but when I turn on the radio and it's politics as usual, I'm like, whatever, change the channel, put on some music. But when I turn on the radio and I hear about war, you know, no one ever says, there was another war today, blah, 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 8,000 people died. No, they said, it's a war! Everyone's going to die! Oh, my God! What are we going to do? Pets' heads are falling off. Right? And you're all freaking out. And you're like, oh, my God, we're all going to be drafted. Keith's dead. Oh, man, like, what are we going to do? You know, there's something about a war that excites people. It really does. I hate to say it, but that's just the truth. And I hate to say it this way, but newspapers love it when there's a good war. Why? Because everyone tunes in. You know, just like the election. I mean, God, I was so sick of it. I'm sure you were too. And so many people suddenly became so interested in politics, and now half of those people don't really care anymore. Oh, sure, they'll give it a good lip service for a few months or more. But like New, Year's, New, like New Year's resolutions, don't worry, they won't last. I hate to break it to you. But for most, they won't last. Now, these newspapers saw an opportunity with the growing crisis in Cuba. And they used sensational writing to lure and engage readers. Oh dear, there was fake news in 1898. It's a good thing we don't do that anymore, right? Ha ha ha, okay. But aid, but aid for Cuba arrived from some unlikely allies. Rival newspaper publishers William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer printed stories about the Butcher Weiler. Not out of any democratic zeal, the stories simply bolstered newspaper sales. They tried to outdo each other by printing sensational pictures and stories that fed the hysteria against Spain embellished stories like this became known as yellow journalism. Peter Frederick Remington was among the many reporters sent to cover the war. In 1897, Remington arrived in Havana to find there were no battles, no cavalry charges, and no artillery barrages. With no story to cover, he wired Hearst. Everything is quiet. There is no trouble. There will be no war. I wish to return. Some say Hearst replied, please remain. You furnish the pictures, and I will furnish the war. And war did come. On January 25, 1898, the USS Maine steamed into Havana Harbor. Outwardly, its mission was to help quell the conflict between the Cubans and Spanish. On February 15, 1898, Captain Charles Sixby was in his cabin after dinner. His crew was below decks. Suddenly, an explosion ripped through the underbelly of the main, killing 266 men. The American headline screamed, it was a Spanish mine. Remember the main became a rallying cry as the American public was whipped into a frenzy. While the U.S. Congress prepared a declaration of war against Spain, forces were deployed to the Caribbean and the Pacific. Anti-expansionists protested loudly. They believed the U.S. was in danger of becoming an imperialist nation. U.S. Navy warships moved in to blockade the harbor of Havana, Cuba's capital. And President McKinley issued a call for 125,000 volunteers. 
Infuriated, Spain declared war on the U.S. Two days later, on April 25th, the U.S. reciprocated. Now, I want you to go back in time about two months. Here we are in the midst of the election. People are about to cast their votes. And oh, now the FBI opens up another investigation on the Hillary Clinton campaign. Oh, man, here we go again, right? And then a couple months later, oh, well, the investigation was actually not really substantial. Hmm. It led many to question, why did that happen? Why was the news so concentrated on this? Or why was the news so concentrated on this? Or why was the news so concentrated on this? Or on even from the other side, you know, why were there so many allegations into Trump's past? So many, you know, why was there so much dirt being dug up on both sides? Well, for one, it's biased journalism. You know, perhaps there's money involved. Number two, it just sells. People are going to read about the latest scandal. And this war was certainly fraught with scandal. You see, there was a telegram sent from, actually, excuse me, a letter sent from a Spanish diplomat stationed in Cuba to the Spanish office in the homeland in Spain. It was from a man named Enrique Dupoy de Lome. And in the letter, again, just the opinion of a diplomat, in the letter, it called President McKinley, President of the United States McKinley, weak and a bidder for peace. He said, oh, he's not going to get involved, help out with the rebellion. He's weak. The United States is going to sit this one out. They're not going to help us put down this rebellion. And it was just, again, the opinion of a diplomat does not reflect the opinion of the nation of Spain. However, somehow, I guess WikiLeaks was around in 1898, somehow this got out. I don't know if Russia was involved or whatever, but anyway, somehow it got out and this was major headline news. Suddenly, the news spun this information and now Spain is calling us weak. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. You can call us all kinds of things, dumb, rednecks, hick, shotgun, pickup truck, wielding, you know, whatever. But you don't call us a bunch of cowards. By gosh, we'll start writing country songs. We'll start using those pickup trucks and we'll mount machine guns on them. You don't call us a bunch of cowards. You don't. Because here's what happened. American opinion started turning towards, guess what, the revolutionary cause. And before you know it, President McKinley was calling for a mobilization of volunteers. And here's where things get really messy. We sent a warship to Havana Harbor in Cuba. Now, the official position of the purpose of this warship was to aid in the evacuation of Americans who were residing in Cuba at that time. So we were to help these Americans get off the island because things were getting tense. Then the warship explodes. Oh my God, let me show you the picture. Oh, wow. Now, let's use truth for a second. Here is a drawing of someone's interpretation of how this explosion looked. The person who drew this picture was not there when it happened. However, this picture was on the front pages of every newspaper around the country. What does this picture make you think happened? That it was attacked, right? That it was a Spanish act of terrorism. Al-Qaeda dumby bombing ships in Havana Harbor. Not really Al-Qaeda, but Spain, right? Yeah. Spain is bombing us. They are using terrorism against us. How dare they? But now let me throw some truth on that story.
The battleship USS Maine steamed into Havana Harbor in late January 1898. While the United States government claimed the battleship was simply making a courtesy visit to Cuba, the ship had really come to protect American lives and property on the island. Cuban revolutionaries had struggled for decades against their Spanish rulers, who had controlled the island for nearly 400 years. In January of 1898, civilian riots left Havana, Cuba's capital, in turmoil and put American lives and investments at risk. The appearance of one of America's premier battleships, bristling with 10-inch guns, helped reassure U.S. citizens in Havana. The Maine dropped anchor in the harbor, and its crew kept a watchful eye on the island. But three weeks later, on February the 15th, the Maine exploded in a gigantic fireball that echoed throughout Havana's streets. 266 men were killed as the Maine's three forward 6 and 10 inch ammunition storage magazines blew up. America turned suspicious eyes toward Spain. For years, Cuban exiles in America and others sympathetic to their cause had been calling for the United States to force the Spanish out of Cuba. Those calls were fueled by the press, which often presented Spain's leaders as evil or less than human. When word of the main explosion reached America, some people, including the powerful newspaper owner William Randolph Hearst, immediately blamed Spain and most of the public believed them. When a team of investigators sent by the Navy concluded that the explosion was the result of a black powder mine, war fever swept across the country. President William McKinley and the U.S. Congress gave in to the public's demands and declared war on April 25, 1898. Within six months, the war was over and Spain was defeated. And the United States was on the road to becoming a world power by gaining Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and the Pacific Islands of Guam and wake from Spain. But a nagging question remained. No direct evidence linking Spain to the sinking of the Maine had been found. So why had the ship blown up? In the 1970s, the Navy launched a new investigation into the case. Admiral Hyman Rickover concluded that the explosion aboard the Maine was not caused by a mine at all. Instead, the ship sank because of a terrible accident. Using various techniques, modern researchers have confirmed Rickover's conclusion that the blast was probably indirectly caused by a spontaneous combustion fire inside the Maine's coal bunker. That coal fire probably heated the wall of the nearby ammunition magazines, causing the shells to explode. So it apparently was a simple accident that destroyed the ship and set up a chain of events that altered the course of American and world history. What is science? No, I mean, come on, seriously. <laughs> it's not like there's facts or anything casting real doubt on that. That's not what the newspapers were looking at. They were saying, terrorism. Mark and blood on American soil. Because technically an American ship is American soil. I mean, anyway. And suddenly, we're at war. In fact, I mean, okay. After the Dulome letter, Spain apologized. They fired that diplomat. They said he does not reflect Spanish opinion. After the Maine, Spain said, we didn't do that either. <laughs> Don't freak out, guys. This is not us. We're friends. Remember, we loaned you money during your own revolution. In fact, Spain agreed to all U.S. demands. The United States said, 
you need to stand down, Spain. We need to conduct an investigation. You need to allow for our inspectors to come on to Havana Harbor to conduct a full investigation. They said, sure, we'll help you. What do you need? We're your friends. But it's too late. Damage is done. The United States declared war in April of 1898. Now, guess what? We had our own reasons. It wasn't just, okay, the newspapers have gotten caught up, and, oh, it's, it's all everybody else's fault. American people are just crazy. No. The, Amer the American government had expressed imperialist intentions in going to war with Spain. In fact, the first battle was nowhere near Cuba. In fact, it was the other side of the world, in Manila, in the Philippines. Why? What, what is the Philippines? Well, there was another Jose Marte type in the Philippines. His name was Emilio Aguinaldo. And he had approached the United States government and said, if you will help us free our country from Spain, we are going to adopt a constitution just like yours. And we're going to be a country just like yours. And we'll be your best friend over here, right next to China and Japan, by the way. And we said, sure. But here's the catch. I don't know if you're a Game of Thrones fan. Never invite a stronger person to fight your battles for you. Because they're probably not fighting your battles for you out of the goodness of their heart. They probably have other intentions. And the United States had other intentions when we helped out the Philippines. In fact, sure, we'll push the Spanish out, but what did we actually do? Oh, we actually conquered the Philippines and we made them a colony of the United States even until the end of the Second World War. Here's the Philippines, by the way, a collection of over a thousand different islands. This was the real win for the United States out of the war with Cuba. On the other side of the world, in the Pacific, Commodore George Dewey received orders to seek the Spanish fleet and capture or destroy it. The Philippines had been oppressed by the Spanish crown for more than 400 years, provoking many revolutions. When the U.S. declared war on Spain, Filipino rebel Emilio Aguinaldo saw a way for the Philippines to achieve independence. On May 1st, Dewey surprised the Spanish fleet in Manila Bay and sank all 10 Spanish ships. During the next three months, some 11,000 U.S. troops joined with the Filipino rebels to defeat the Spanish. Aguinaldo declared Philippine independence on June 12th. With the Philippines seemingly under control, U.S. troops moved on to capture Guam. Meanwhile, back in the Caribbean, the 9th Cavalry, a unit of African-American soldiers, arrived in Cuba. They found the Army quartermasters totally unprepared for the thousands of troops pouring in. Equipment was disorganized. They were issued woolen uniforms in the tropical heat. Both black and white soldiers were forced to live in unsanitary conditions with poor rations. Diseases such as yellow fever broke out and thousands were hospitalized. Of the 5,400 deaths in the Cuban campaign, only 379 were the result of combat. Teddy Roosevelt quit his desk job as Secretary of the Navy and became second in command of a volunteer regiment called the Rough Riders. They were a motley crew of some 1,200 men, including the socially prominent, cowboys, musicians, and clerks. In a critical battle, Teddy Roosevelt led the Rough Riders on a charge up Kettle Hill. They came under heavy fire, but were aided by the two regiments of African-American soldiers. They sacked Kettle Hill, but at great cost. What a sight was presented as I recrossed the flat in front of San Juan, the dead and wounded soldier. It was indescribable. In short order, the U.S. captured San Juan Hill and seized the Spanish fort while destroying Cuban ships in the Straits of Havana. With the situation in hand in Cuba and the Pacific, the U.S. now turned 18,000 troops and a naval escort on another Spanish colony in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico. They landed at Guanaca Bay, but before they could reach the capital city, Spain agreed to sign a peace treaty with the United States, putting an end to all military hostilities. The war was over in just four months, 
the truce with Spain was signed on August 12, 1898. It was a splendid little war, commented soon-to-be Secretary of State John Hay. So, the war in the Caribbean. Yes, we had intentions in getting involved in Cuba, certainly. We weren't just helping them out of the goodness of our heart, either. The United States blockaded Cuba. We surrounded them with our Navy. Um, the Spanish fleet in Santiago de Cuba Harbor was completely outnumbered and outgunned. While the Navy was entirely prepared for this scope of campaign. This was exactly what we had built up our Navy for, was naval conquest of small islands for strategic gain. However, the U.S. Army was rather ill-prepared. Uh, we had a small professional force, mostly volunteers. McKinley had called for about 120,000 volunteers. Uh, many of these were um, either very young and weren't even alive when the Civil War happened, or they were very old Civil War veterans, and so too old to be very useful. Uh, they were actually ill-prepared and ill-equipped. There were more deaths in this war as the result of food poisoning from really gross meat than there was anything else. More people died of yellow fever even than bullets. And there's really not much to talk about in terms of battles or great, you know, it's not, it's not like a Pearl Harbor or a D-Day where it's been forever memorialized. The only real battle worth mentioning was the Battle of San Juan Hill. And even though the war was basically over, it was a strategic hill and it was a Spanish stronghold, but the main reason I even bring it up is because guess who, Teddy Roosevelt led the charge up the hill. And sure, he had political ambitions. The military is a great way to make a name for yourself. I mean, so many of our politicians had long careers in the military and that helped launch their political career. So when Teddy Roosevelt formed the Rough Riders, and there was even a movie about it, it's not bad, it's not great, but anyway, um, the end of the movie concludes with this dramatic charge up the hill. Under machine gun fire, under artillery fire, Teddy Roosevelt led the charge. And you know, probably most of that is true. The guy had nerves of steel. But nonetheless, the war was coming to a quick conclusion. U.S. troops also invaded Puerto Rico. And the Spanish had no interest in going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the United States. But here's an old painting of the Rough Riders. The war did last long enough for Teddy Roosevelt to pose with this man and say, can you draw a picture of us real quick? You know, that's, again. And here was another artist rendering. I'm sure Teddy Roosevelt paid to have this one drawn as well, because here he's shown as the heroic figure leading the charge up the hill. It may have been a splendid little war, but it left a distasteful legacy. On December 10, 1898, the Treaty of Paris was signed, giving the United States the right to occupy Cuba with full control over Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. In the Philippines, Emilio Aguinaldo and his supporters were angered as one colonial power was replaced with another. On February 4th, 1899, he declared war on the U.S. forces in the islands. It was a brutal war of massacre and torture with U.S. forces taking on an ugly role, forcing Filipino civilians to live in areas where disease, hunger, and poor sanitation killed thousands, much as the Spanish under Butcher Weiler did in Cuba. In the end, more than 20,000 Filipino rebels and some 4,000 Americans were dead. At home, anti-imperialists complained that the war's purpose was to free Spain's colonies, but the result was the U.S. becoming an imperial power. The famed American writer Mark Twain sarcastically noted, There must be two Americas, one that sets the captive free and one that takes the once captive's new freedom away. Ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court decided how new territories would be handled. Puerto Rico became an incorporated territory, 
allowing Puerto Ricans to become U.S. citizens and the right to vote on statehood. On the other hand, the Philippines remained unincorporated. In 1902, Filipinos held elections for their House of Representatives, a first step on their long journey toward independence. While the Filipinos were struggling to gain independence in the Pacific, a similar battle was being waged in the Caribbean. In 1900, the Cubans wrote a constitution. Fearful that another country would dominate Cuban affairs, the U.S. Congress insisted that Cubans add provisions known as the Platt Amendment, which limited Cuba's rights to make treaties and permitted the U.S. to send troops into Cuba to keep order. Cuba became a protectorate of the United States. So the war concluded with the signing of the Treaty of Paris in August of 1898. So it really was a splendid little war. Started in April, done by August. Nice little summer affair for some people. The agreements were not so pleasant. Spain had to relinquish control of Cuba, as well as Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. So much of the rest of their Caribbean territories were handed over to the United States with the addition of the big win in the Philippines for the United States as well. The Philippines were sold to the United States. We had promised Emilio Aguinaldo that we would free his people from Spanish misrule. Instead, we purchased his territory and made it a colony of our own. The Treaty of Paris sparked a debate. And I love that quote by Mark Twain where he says, there must be two Americas, one that sets people free and the other that takes those once freed people and places them back in captivity. Hmm. Glad we don't do that anymore. Now, uh, McKinley tried to justify the annexation of the Philippines on moral grounds, saying there are a bunch of heathens that need some salvation. But really, let's be honest. We have great commercial interest in the Philippines. It's right next to China, which you'll hear all about in the next section. And so Mark Twain joined a group called the Anti-Imperialist League, saying this is totally messed up what we're doing. Anyway, here's a picture of the signing of the Treaty of Paris. And my work cited. <laughs> 